home. He was away for this weekend, but he is home and ready to start us off on our new series. Thanks, honey. Hey, good morning, everybody. Wasn't my wife cute with her little, little wing? I don't know if you noticed. She's not wearing her sling anymore, but she had shoulder surgery like four and a half weeks ago, something like that. And so she can't, still can't lift that thing up. So just a plug to say hi to my wife without giving her a hug. Even on the side without the shoulder, you reach around to the side that was injured and like, hey, yeah, just be careful. Thank you so much, everybody, for your gentleness in the lobby afterwards. Um, before I get into the message today, I want to say uh, this morning, we're actually going to be taking a special offering. We're going to be passing the, the buckets real quick here for our benevolence fund. This is something we do maybe a couple times a year. I'm, I'll mention our benevolence fund. It's the fund that we have available all the time. You can give to it at any time. But it's the fund we use to bless those in need in our community, especially in our church community. So when people have a need, when they've gotten to that point financially where they say, I need to come to my church and ask for help, that is a, that's a spot. That's a spot to be in. And what an honor and a priv privilege it is for us to be a support, an emotional support, a financial support, and a spiritual support for people as they walk through that type of situation in their lives. Well, right now, our Benevolence Fund is at the, at the line. So we're in the black, but we know a couple requests are coming in this week that are going to bring it to the red, which means we have no nest egg at the moment to help those who come to us with needs. And we, we always want to keep that, that fund up so we can be available to support those. You might be somebody who supports people individually when you hear of a need. Keep doing that, please. That's what we do as a family. But you also might be somebody who wants to support, but you, you don't know when those needs come in. We do. We know when the needs come in. So if, if you're in that position, you're like, I want to give to this. Please give. Maybe you've never given to church yet, and you, you, you want to dip your toe in, and this is a great first opportunity to give to something you know is going to minister to 100% of the funds that come in we use to bless those in our, in our church community and our community that need support. So if you'd like to give, that'd be amazing. I want to invite our, our ushers, our service, ho service hosts to come up and start passing the baskets right away. You can also give, if you don't have anything to give today, you can also give all of the time through elamlife.church slash giving. You just select Benevolence Fund in the drop-down menu. You can do it through the Church Center app as well. Thank you so much for helping us to bless those in need in our family. Now, um, one more thing. Uh, I don't know which direction you came to come into church today, but if you came from the Dalton Road entrance, you saw some shocking things. Shocking in our driveway. There are like three dumpsters over there, and there's pallets full of shingles, because we're getting a new roof this week, everybody. Come on, I'm almost crying thinking about it. We're getting a new roof this week. Man, we, for those of you who are, maybe this is one of your first weeks with us, and you're like, a uh, new roof? You're cheering about? Yes, we're cheering because that new roof is $175,000. We started a capital campaign just a couple months ago, and God has provided through you miraculously. And we're at a spot where we can cover the entire cost of the roof, and we have a little bit more that's going to start going towards our new HVAC unit that we need for this, this room. We're, we're getting there. We are getting there, and praise God that the biggest need is being covered, and we have a lo long way to go. So if you haven't jumped in yet, I want to just want to encourage you to consider jumping in. We have 113 households so far that have jumped in, that have been a part of this, this campaign said, I want to help my family. I want to help my family to grow, and I want to help my family to thrive in this house that God has blessed us with. If you want to jump in, come on, let's get it. Our next goal is 120. 120 households participating in this campaign. I just want to invite you to jump in. Thank you so much to everybody who's given so far and everybody who's about to. We love you. We appreciate you. Let's go. Let's see God do it. Amen? Amen. Yeah, Jesus. All right, so we are in the, the beginning, week one of an amazing series that we're starting right now. I'm super excited about this. We are going to enter into the awe of the God of creation for the next six weeks. We're starting a series called Genesis. In the next six weeks, we're walking through the first book of the Bible. 
Now, why, why, I mean, we have every, we have 66 books and we have a billion topics that we can preach on. Why are we choosing to walk through the book, the first book, the book that starts the Bible? Because it's important to know our beginnings. It's so important to know the beginnings of our story, to have an understanding of the God who created us and what his intention was in the beginning. Origin stories are super powerful because they not only tell you how something began, but they show you what's to come. They give you an insight into, okay, why did that happen? What was the intention of that thing? And how do we then move forward from that beginning point? We're going to have, as we know our beginnings, a new understanding of the God who created us and his intention. We're going to get a picture of the main players in the saga of humanity. What are we going to explore? These will be up on the screen for you. We're going to explore who our creator is, who we are, why we were made, and our path forward. That's what we're going after starting today new understanding of our origins. And we're going to take the opportunity, and I want to encourage you right now, right before I pray to open us up, start stirring up. But just close your eyes with me for a moment. Let's just ask, Lord, would you help us to stir up a new sense of awe, of wonder, at the bigness, the beauty, the, the benevolence of our amazing God of creation. Lord, help us to stir it up as we get into this series. Lord, thank you that you are utterly amazing and you are amazingly for us. Jesus, we choose to fix our eyes on you as we explore the origins of all things. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, as we get into the, the beginning of this story, as we start reading through today the first couple books, in the uh, fir first couple chapters in this book of Genesis, it's really easy and normal to start getting into that mindset of, all right, well, what does this actually mean? What is this actually saying? Well, when did this actually happen? And how did it happen? And how long did it take? All of those questions pop into our, our minds. But that's not our goal during this series. We're not going into the nitty-gritty of how, when, how long, all of those details. I want you to picture it this way. I want you to picture a couple different boxes, okay? So this box— first box is a box that says, God created the world. All right? And then you have another box that a whole lot of people in our world are in. Sadly, it seems like that number keeps growing. The box that says, God did not create the world. Now, most, hopefully all of us in the room are in this box, God created the world. Within this box, there are a whole lot of different other boxes that explain the, the how. How did it happen? And when did it happen? And how long did it happen? All the different details, all the different philosophies and theologies of how did this go down? Now, within each of those boxes, there are other different boxes that go after the details of each of those different philosophies, each of those different perspectives. So sitting in this room, on one side of the auditorium, there's somebody that has a real hardcore, like, this is literally what this means when you read this in the book of Genesis. And you're in that box that says God created the world. On the other side of the auditorium, there's somebody who has a different perspective of when it happened, how long it took, and what was God's perspective in that moment? What are the details of that thing? And guess what? They're also in the box that says God created the world. And guess what? you're going to worship the Lord in heaven with both of those people. We're all worshiping Jesus together. If you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're not going to get into the, the specifics of the different philosophies of creation. We are going to enter into the story and say, Lord, give us a new awe for who you are as the creator. And help us to understand what your intention was and where we're going because of who you are and what you did. Not the details of how and when things happen, but the who of him and the beginnings of his interaction with the who of us. That's what we're going after in this series. The idea is for us to make a transition from reading stories about God to stepping into the stories themselves. So how many of you have ever watched a movie or read a book and you've said, man, I would love to be in that story? Like not if, if it's a movie, not like I want to be an actor in the in the story, following the director's direction. But I'd love to be in the story. I'd love to be living in that place. I'd love to be interacting with those people. I'd, 
love to be flying in the spaceship with a shaggy alien. Like, that would be amazing, right? I, have you ever felt that way? So my, my older kids and I, we started watching the, the Planet of the Apes movies. I do not want to live in that, 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 that's not a cool realm. If you've never watched the Planet of the Apes movies, you can imagine what it is by the name of the movie, Planet of the Apes. It's a planet with apes that are super intelligent, super strong, not always benevolent towards humans. I'm good. I'm good not living in that, in that world. But there are, other, there are other movies that I'm like, oh, well, it would be pretty, pretty amazing to like, be friends with Iron Man, right? Can I try out one of your suits just one time? Or to watch, watch Wesley humiliate Humperdinck. That would be pretty fun to be like, kind of sitting in the corner of the room watching that thing happen to Princess Bride. But here's why I ask the question. Rather than just reading stories about this character called God, when you become a Christian, you get to enter into the story. You get to experience with an actual relationship with the one the Bible describes as the creator of all things. Hopefully that blows your mind a little bit. Again, one of my goals today is to draw, draw up, to, to stir up some awe, some wonder at who this is, this one we call God. He's not just a character. He's not in a made-up story. He's not a legend. He's alive, and he's in the room right now. We got to experience his touch as we worshiped. We get to listen to his voice in this moment. He's here. He's alive. He's with us. He's for you. So as we get into this series, I want to ask, has this happened for you yet? Has, has the Bible stopped being simply a story that you enjoy? Has it started to be a way for you to spend time with and hear from your Father? The one who created you. The one who loves you. The one who has purpose for your life. Has the Bible become more than a book? Have you allowed God through his word to start to direct the course of your every day? Has this book given you the foundation of what to do and what to think and how to believe and how to move? If yes... Buckle up for this ride as we go through this Genesis series. If no, if not yet, if you haven't gotten there yet, if you haven't entered into the story with the God who loves you yet, buckle up for this ride. Because he's inviting you into the story. He's inviting you to enter in. Today's the day for you to say yes to him. So, so this morning, we're going to start by looking at the first couple chapters of Genesis. And in in honor of how, how big, how great our God is, and how great his creation is, I've titled today's series, Chapters 1 and 2, Grand Designs. Day 1, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. This is, a, this is a very cool mental picture. I don't know if you've ever paused and stepped back and looked at this in your mind's eye. What did this look like? Imagine God hovering over the deep waters, which were as yet formless and void. No limit, no boundaries, no structure, no life within them. Just darkness and deep. But God was there, hovering, Waiting. Ready. I want you to practice what I, what I just encouraged you with a minute ago. I want you to practice putting yourself into this story. Seeing yourself in the story. Have you ever been in a dark, disorienting place? Are you there now? Maybe like Sharon encouraged us during, during worship. Maybe you're feeling like, man, everything's on fire everything's just ash right now. I, I don't even see life anywhere. I am struggling. I am hurting. I am broken. Is that feeling dark? Have you ever wondered where God was in those dark moments of your life? Well, he's, he's hovering. He's waiting. He's ready. Ready for what? Verse 3, Then God said, Let there 
be light. And what? And there was light. He's ready to speak light into the darkness. He's ready to speak light into your darkness. God spoke and everything changed. This is going to be a theme we're going to see throughout this passage we're reading today is that when God speaks, things change. When God speaks, things are created. When God speaks, new life comes and God wants to speak over your darkness. God wants to speak over your void, over your chaos. He wants to speak light. Verse 4, And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. Notice on day one, this always blew me away. Actually, I didn't notice this until not too many years ago. On day one, he created light. But there was still no source of light created. Where did the light come from? It came from him. He is the source of light in day one of creation. He's the source of light in your world today. An evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Then God said, let there be space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. Again, there was, no, there was still no boundary. There was, no, there was just, just a chaos for this world-sized mass of water. Verse 7, and that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth, starting to bring form to it from the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky, and evening passed, and morning came, marking the second day. Then God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so dry ground may appear. And that's what happened. God called the dry ground land, and the water seas, and God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. This is the second time we've heard him say it was good. Why does God keep saying God saw that it was good? Well, I want you to imagine these moments as they're, as they're taking place in the newness of time, in the beginning of creation. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, and then there's water. But there's no way to see this great mass of roiling liquid in this new realm that's called the physical. So next, God speaks, and light phew, appears. Which was a better sound I could have made for that. It was more, it was more dramatic than that. I, I guarantee it. The light appears, which illuminates the current chaos. It makes the turmoil completely visible. Still formless, still void, but light. We can see. Day three comes in this stuff called dirt. This thing called land, earth materializes and forces this unruly, chaotic liquid to come into shape, to come into order, to come into place this far and no further. You must stay. We're just in the middle of day three. God's looking around at what he's created, what he's done so far in the realm of the physical, and he is thrilled. He is psyched. He's excited about what he sees, about what he's creating. Now, many of you were a part of the church a year ago when Melanie and I and our family took 13 weeks on a planned sabbatical, 13 weeks away from, from church, away from here, on vacation. It was crazy. Now, God, before we took the, that time away, he showed me, he's like, I want you to take time throughout your 13 weeks to just take it in. And so there are many times, most days, I would have a moment where I would just step back from what's happening and I'd be like, whoa, I'm on a 13-week sabbatical. I have 13 weeks. I don't have to produce anything. I don't have to lead anything but my family. I don't have to, I don't have to make things happen. I don't have to strategize. I can just be. I can refresh. I have an amazing staff at church just down the road. They're running things fantastic. They're not calling me, so things are going great. Everything's going well, and Lord, how thankful I am. How much gratitude do I feel for this moment? It took some time to step back and take it in. It's, it's the same reason that I, I often share this as much as I remember to do so with newlyweds. As I'm performing their wedding or I'm just friends with them going to the wedding, I'd, I'll say, would you just one just take a minute, take 60 seconds during your, your reception and just hand in hand, arm in arm, would you just step back and would you just look 
Just take it in. Look at all the people who are here because they love you. Look at all the, the stuff that's happening in honor of you. Look at God shining his light of blessing down on you in this most fantastic of days of your life. Take it in, because too often we get to the end of a moment like that and realize, I didn't even notice. It went by so fast. I didn't even, I can't even remember all the things that happened. I think this is the moment that God was in. That he's, he's, he's in this place where he's like, whoa, this is amazing. Look at what's happening. Look at what, what, is, what is being created. And I think he felt even that feeling of gratitude. Thankfulness. Thankfulness to who? Well, to him. He's the only one there. Not even bugs yet. He's grateful. Like, I get to experience this. We, we have these moments in our lives. Maybe you've, hopefully you've experienced them. Maybe, maybe on your wedding day or maybe when your child was born. For me, those are definitely those days. Like, I get to experience this in my life. Becoming the pastor of this church was one of those, those days. There's, there's so many even, even littler things. Like, like Melanie shared that I was away for a couple days. Nathan Sanders, Evan Thorpe, and John Chapel and I went away to Miami for two days. Thursday through last night. I got home after midnight last night. Praise God. Crazy story. We made it back to go to a, we were there for a conference just to, just to experience God, to, to be refreshed, to be poured into, to, to get away and say, Lord, impart something, inspire us, refresh us as a team. It was amazing. And it's one of those, like, we get to do, we're in Miami. My goodness, this is unbelievable. It was cooler there than it was here, but it was still amazing. God's like, he's in this moment. He's like, this is great. He's taking it in. He's enjoying the moment. He is the first. He is the primary who of creation, and this is him. He's not some aloof, distant God who couldn't care less. He's invested. He's present. He's fully present. He's fully aware, and he's in love. He's in love. He's in love with you, his creation. He's pleased with you. Continuing day three, verse 11, God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came, and that is what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants, and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind, and God saw that it was, it was good, and evening it passed, and morning came, marking the third day. Day 4, verse 14. Then God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Remember, God created light before he created the sources of light here. Day four, he created the sources that we know up in the, up in the sky. I love day four because of that, because it's just that cool picture of him giving us these, these physical sources of light now, and also because he created the stars. Did you know that because of how far away God put them, because of how big, how vast Jesus created the universe to be, that every time we look up, especially at the night sky, we're looking into the past. We're seeing history every time we look at the sky. When the sun rises in the morning, out of the darkness, this great ball of burning gas appears in our sky at our horizon. You're looking eight and a half minutes into the past. Because of how long it takes light to travel the 93 million miles from our nearest star to Earth. How about another star? We have a picture of it on the screen. Sirius, or the dog star. It's the nearest star to us we can see with the naked eye, and it's also the brightest star. It's 8.6 light years away. So when we see this star, the brightest star that you see in the nighttime sky, you're looking over eight and a half years into the past. One of the brightest stars we can see is another one. Uh, it's called Betelgeuse. It's actually how it's pronounced. It's spelled differently, praise the Lord. It's so far away that if it exploded tomorrow, we wouldn't know it for 640 years. 
We're looking into the past 640 years when we see the light from Beetlejuice. God created the stars. Why? For you. For you to know the vastness, the awesome power of God. Are you feeling any awe towards your God this morning? Experience any sense of, experiencing a sense of wonder as we read the story about the God above all who out of nothing created everything. There's a Latin phrase that speaks to this aspect of the story we're reading today. And it says, creation ex nihilo. Creation ex nihilo. It means creation out of nothing. God spoke and matter formed. And he loved it. Verse 19. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fourth day. Now here is where life begins. Then God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Here's where we take a big turn. Here's where the pinnacle of creation, you, come into the story. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit saying, let's do this thing and let's do something special. Let's create something that is beyond anything we've created to this point. It's beyond the, the sun, the moon, and the stars. It's beyond the animals and the, the fish and the birds. It's beyond the oceans, beyond the land, the mountains, the, the valleys, the volcanoes, beyond anything. Let's create human beings in our image to be like us. This is the first time that God uses the language to be like us or in our likeness. We were made, we were formed in the very image of the God of creation. What does that mean? It means that we were created with the ability to be aware like God is. Beyond the rest of creation, we are created with the capacity for reason, morality, language, personality. The plants and animals don't get that. We were created with purpose for every individual life. Your life, every person's life has purpose and intention and a plan. Every life is precious. We were created with the capacity for relationship with God and with each other, created with the ability to experience and process concepts of love and truth and beauty. And you were created as a representation and a representative of God. You were designed to reflect the goodness, the personality, the glory of God to the rest of creation. Including to each other. We're not going to read all of chapter 2 when we're done with chapter 1, obviously. But it takes a deeper dive into this moment on day 6. Starting at verse 7, chapter 2 says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. God literally got his hands dirty to create humanity. This is the first time that he didn't speak something into being, but he got his hands dirty and he formed the first man. Makes me think of the times when my family and I have gone to the beach. We've brought our buckets and our shovels and we've, we've crafted the most beautiful sandcastle. It really is terrible. Terrible. We do our best, right? But we're not professionals at this. We're just trying to create this thing that looks sort of like a castle. And we dig the moats and we try to make it so that the water, when there's a big wave, it comes up and doesn't destroy the castle. But it kind of flows into the moat around the castle. And we dig little tunnels. So there's, there's got to be a way to get into the castle, right? So you create these little bridges and stuff. And it was like, we step back and we're like, whoa, that's pretty cool. 
Now, it's amazing. We take pictures and selfies with the castle to remember the moment. I, I imagine Jesus down in his, in, on his hands and his knees, and he's gathering the sand, the dust, and the dirt, and he's forming man. And he looks over, and he looks at his father to see, am I doing it right? Does it look like him? He keeps looking back and forth, and he, he's forming the man, and he finally steps back and says, that's good. He looks like my father. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't take a selfie and say, yeah, did it. Moving on. Scripture says, at that point, he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils. And the man became a living person. They, that's us, verse 26 goes on to say, will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them three times, three ways. God reinforces this idea. We were created in his image. We were created as the most special, the peak of his creation. We were created to represent him to each other and to the world around us. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. We're getting to know the main who of creation, what he did, what he's like, how he feels about the creation that he created, how much care he took to create us. Now this is the first moment where he gives the first command to the pinnacle of his creation. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And what? Govern it. Reign. I love that, that he's called us to reign, but reign according to what? Reign how? What do you mean reign? How do we lead this thing? How do we do this well? God wasn't a God that came in and said, hey, reign, good luck with that, and walk away. I don't know how many of you have ever had a job where somebody says to you, hey, there's this thing, there's this project, there's this, this task we want you to do. Good luck with that, and they walked away. And you're like, what do you mean good luck? What lever do I pull? What button do I push? What instructions do I follow? How do I walk this thing out? That's, that's crazy. God didn't do that. He said, rain. But just, would you walk with me? Walk arm in arm with me. I will show you the way. I'll show you which lever to pull. I'll show you which button to push. Listen for my voice. I'll tell you what to do. Watch what I do in relationship with me. Follow my steps. I'll show you where to walk. There's his kindness and his gentleness that he comes alongside us and says, I'll, I'll guide you like a loving father. He gave us authority and dominion over this planet. And he gave us himself for a model of how to do it how to lead well, but in order to do that, we need to be in relationship with him, the one who created us, the one who's not just a legend in a story, but the one who's alive and with us in this room today, inviting us to enter into the story. He's not just a model, but, he, but the, the authority that, he, that we have to lead, to reign in the earth as the pinnacle of his creation, it's delegated authority. It's his authority that he has blessed us with to follow his lead. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be taking a look at how we, how we do the beginning of the story, the book of Genesis. Spoiler alert, not good. We do not do good. <laughs> this story it is crazy. We have some great preachers. Melanie's going to be preaching. Nathan's going to be preaching. I'm going to be preaching the series. You're going to get some insights into our story, some direction going forward. Then God said, verse 29, Look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made, and he said that it was, nope, very 
good. He said that it was very good. God finished the work of creation. He looks at all of it. He looks at you, and he doesn't just say, that's good. He says, that's very good. That's very good. That's very good. At no point does he look at his creation and say, ah, the ears were supposed to go on the front of the face. Or, oh my goodness, the grass was supposed to be blue and the sky was supposed to be green. At no point does he say, Holy Spirit, Jesus, what did you say they're going to do? They're going to rebel? They're not going to listen? They're not going to love me back? Forget this. Let's wipe them out. Let's start over again. Never once did he say it wasn't good. And when he looks at you, he said, you were very good. Knowing all the stuff, knowing the darkness that was coming in the heart of humanity, he said it was very good. He didn't mess up. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. Your origin story is pretty amazing. I hope as we are entering into this series, as we're getting into this message, this understanding of who we are, where do we come from, who is our Father, who's our Creator, that it's stirring up a sense of awe and wonder in you again. Because your Creator is pretty unbelievable. I, I shared four things put up on the screen earlier that we were going after today. Who is He? Who is our creator? He is God. He is good. Who are we? We are sons and daughters of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the omnipotent one who oversaw creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. He spoke and it came. He spoke, and it was formed in all its complexity, in all its beauty. We're sons and daughters of the Creator. We were designed to reflect Him. Why were we made? We were made not because He needed you, not because He needed us, not because this realm called the physical was like it was always just meant to be beyond the will of God. No, it's because He wanted to. It was, an, uh, it was out of an overflow of his love. He wanted someone, he wanted some ones to love, to walk with, to be in relationship with. He wanted some ones to receive his love, to live in friendship with him, to follow his lead, to rule and reign like him. What's the path forward? What's our path forward? We're going to be learning about our path forward for the next several weeks as we keep going through the book of Genesis. But to begin, it's time to believe that God made you very good. It's time to hold on tight to him. It's time to stay faithful to the creator, the only one that knows what lever to pull and what button to push what voice to listen to, his, what steps to take, what direction to go, who to be in relationship with, how to share the good news of God. It's time to live in relationship with the one who gave himself for you. It's time to follow his word. It's time to reign as his kid with him as your authority. It's time to have a relationship with the one who gave himself for you. It's time to be friends with God. That's the step forward. That's the path forward. Starting today. At the beginning of the message, I encourage you to buckle up for the ride. And if we have, uh, if Jacob is, is ready and wants to come up and play the keys, we're, we're just coming to the end. Buckle up for the ride because God's inviting you into the story. God's inviting you to participate in the story with him. He's inviting you to know him, not just know about him, but to live in friendship with the God of creation to turn from your sins and to say, yeah, God, I want to be your friend. I want you to live your life through me. Would you stand to your feet with me?
today's the day for you to say yes to him, to follow his lead. Even when things don't go according to plan, quick story. Um, I told you the story of getting home last night was crazy. We got home after midnight. That was actually planned, but the way that that happened wasn't according to plan. We had an airline cancel our flight. They actually didn't cancel. We were supposed to get on the flight a little after 5 yesterday afternoon, and they postponed it, postponed it, till 8.25 this morning to fly out of Fort Lauderdale. We're like, yeah, that'll work to get back to church on time for my 8.30 service. And so we had to scramble. We found another flight that was going to fly us into Buffalo. We are going to get home, I don't know, 1, one thirty in the morning. That, w- that would have been great. Like, we would have been back. Um, our first leg was from Fort Lauderdale to Baltimore. And on our first leg, we were, we were flying southwest. And I don't know if you've fl- flown southwest, but you don't have assigned seats. You just have assigned positions in line. You can pick your seat when you get on the, on the plane. So we got on the plane. We were last ones booked, so we're last ones on the plane. So we're looking around like, yep, we're not sitting together this leg. And so we each sat with a different family. And God gave each one of us opportunity to minister to each one of those families. And we get off the plane and we're like, what? That was fantastic. Listen to my story. Listen to my story. And here's what I talked about with, with the person I was sitting next to. And as we walk off the plane, right in front of us, the gate right across from us in Baltimore, it says, like we're flying into Buffalo, right? We're leaving in about an hour. We see a sign that says Rochester, New York, boarding in 19 minutes. Same airline. And so John Chapel, he's like, ah, uh, he just beelines. I'm just getting out of the, out of, out of, off the plane, and he beelines it over there, and he tells them our situation, says, we, my pastor's got to preach tomorrow. Can, we get, can you get him to Rochester? And they're like, well, let's see what we can do. There's 90-something seats available on the plane. 90-something seats. We're like, yeah. So, so 15 seconds later, they're like, here you go. You're on the plane. God bless you. Oh, come on. The plan doesn't always look great, right? It, I mean, you might be in that place I mentioned earlier, the place of darkness and turmoil and like formless and void. And where are you, God? Not feeling him hovering, waiting, ready. Or you, don't, you don't know that he's there, but he's there. You're, you might have great plans, a great flight lined up. In last minute, God's going to be like, yeah, nope, and turn your direction. You have no idea why, but if you're following the lead of the Creator, the one that you were formed in the image of, in the likeness of, the one that He says, I'm going to show you which lever to pull, which button to push. If you're following Him, if you're listening to Him, if you're looking to Him, if you're walking in relationship with Him, then even when the side swipes come, even when it feels like your legs are taken out from under you, even when you're like, I don't know which way to turn, You have a guide. You have a creator who loves you, who says you are very good. I want to be your father. I want to lead you. I want to love you. Would you love me? Jesus, we say yes. We say yes. Thank you for the picture of who you are, for the glory, awesomeness of the God of creation. Thank you for a new sense of awe, a new sense of wonder, a new sense of, wow, I don't believe I get to do this. I get to live life. I get to walk through the good things and the hard things because I get to do it with you, God. Lord, as we get into this, this book, this series, grow us, God, as we, as we look at the beginnings, as we look at our origin story, God, grow us, that we would do the right things, Lord, the things that the Bible says, these are good, do these things, and we wouldn't, do the, we wouldn't make the mistakes that we see the early humans making. Set our feet on, good, on a good path, God. Set our, set our, plant our feet on firm ground. I pray for your blessing and your favor on each one of these, your kids, today. For any that don't know you yet, Lord Jesus, that today would be the day where they say, I'm entering the story. 
God's not just a legend. He's present. He's alive. He's here. He loves me. Lord, I pray for the miracle of salvation. Lord, you are the one that lead people to you. Lord, would you lead those in this room, those watching online even after this moment, Lord, would you lead them to you, God, that they would say, yeah, Jesus, I surrender my heart, my life to you. I give it up. I know you're my creator. I know you formed me in your image. I want to follow your lead. I turn from my sins. I walk with you. I follow your lead, God. Lord, save souls today. And help us to live, every one of us to live in awe and in wonder of our God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Ministry teams, you can come on down. If you have a need for anything, if you just want to sit and soak in his presence, hang out here in the auditorium, come on up to the front row where people will hopefully not bother you. If you want to receive prayer for healing, release, you need a prophetic word for something, come on up and just ask him to pray. We'll see what God says. But we love you. Go in God today, church. We'll see you next week. God bless everybody.